Welcome to Witch Talks, a series for spiritual seekers, witches and enlightened souls. I'm Hannah the Suburban Witch, an intuitive tarot reader, astrologer and eclectic witch, and I hope you're ready to get up close and personal with your favourite witches. You guys, I got another beautiful review coming in for the podcast and I'm going to tell you all about it. This one comes in from Beck and they say, I love listening to Hannah's podcast as each one has something new and has a wealth of knowledge to be gained. Highly recommend Hannah and her business, Suburban Witchery. Thank you so much, Beck. I am so grateful for your review and for your kind words about both the podcast and also my business. If anyone listening wasn't aware, I run a business. It's called Suburban Witchery. It's in the name of the podcast. And with my business, I do lots of stuff. I have a course on psychic divination, and I will let you guys know when the doors open for that one again. I offer guidance calls where I might use the tarot or astrology and my intuition to help guide you in all of life's decisions and ups and downs. I provide astrology reports, chakra checkups. I've got ritual worksheets for the new and full moon on my website. I have a a free guided meditation on the website as well that you can download. It's also on YouTube. I have my YouTube. I have lots of stuff, blogs. There is, there's so much going on here for absolutely everyone. So jump onto my website, suburbanwitchery.com. Have a little poke around if you'd like, and I'll stop talking now and we can get on with this episode. In this episode, I'm chatting with Tanae Stewart, a witch, astrologer, and author on a mission to embody simplicity in magic, astrology, and self-care. Her work empowers modern witches to nourish their minds, bodies, and intuition so they can be their most magical selves all day, every day. She is the author of The Modern Witch's Guide to Magical Self-Care, a number one new release on Amazon, and The Modern Witch's Guide to Natural Magic, and I can't wait to share her work and her wisdom with you all today. So let's get into it. She is joining us via Zoom all the way from California. Hey, Tanae, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad that you've decided to come on and chat with me and we get to talk not quite in real life, but kind of in real life. (laughs) Kind of, yeah, as close as we need to. Yeah, definitely. Now, normally I start my episodes off by taking a little squidgery ditch or a little look at my guests' birth charts. But since you're a fellow astrologer, I thought I'd switch it up a little bit and include you in on this. So I had a look at your chart and I noticed what some astrologers would term a stellium. So the definition of a stellium varies astrologer to astrologer. Personally, I classify a stellium as three or more planets, but not including Uranus, Neptune or Pluto, which is those outer planets. And I I see them within five degrees of each other in the same sign and the same house, which I use Placidus. So for anyone listening, Placidus houses in that housing system don't always fall in the same, like the same sign doesn't fall in the same houses. They can sort of cross over each other. So it's a little bit difficult. Um, However, in your chart, you have the moon, Mercury and Venus all in Aries in the eighth house, but they're not all within five degrees. So whilst some astrologers call it a stellium, I wouldn't, but I'm curious what you classify. Do you classify yourself as having a stellium? Yeah, that's such a good question. It's one of those that has so many different definitions. Um, I pretty much work with basically any grouping of three or more in a sign and house. Um, Definitely, I would also give less weight if it had outer planets, um, unless it was like outer planets with a lot of personal planets too. Um, So I consider it a stellium. I think it's they're, they're a little bit spread. I think it's about 15 degrees um, between all of them. But because they're all personal planets, like it's, I definitely feel it very strongly. Um, and I was also born on a cusp. I'm a, my son is zero degrees of Taurus. Um, and I never really, I always felt like a Taurus before I, you know, understood astrology and could read charts and things. I, I always felt that, that not every, some people born on cusp really feel like the other sign. Um, but when I first really saw my chart for the first time and really started to understand it, I really understood that like, even though I feel so much like a Taurus and I'm I'm born on the cusp and, and, you know, really lean into that Taurus energy, Aries is such a um, deeper kind of more private part of me, um, which, you know, of course is my moon, but then to see the the other personal planets in there too, it's definitely an emphasized part of my chart. (laughs) And, And you technically, when we're talking about housing systems as well, 
you use the whole whole house system, don't you? I do. Yeah. So I work with whole signs, and, which is funny because when I first started practicing astrology and then learning to read my chart, I was really drawn to whole signs houses because I just felt like Placidus was it was sort of confusing, it was a little complicated for a brand new astrologer, not even an astrologer, right? Someone just learning astrology. Um, and now I understand that the reason I was drawn to whole signs is because my chart actually barely changes between the two um, because of, you know, numbers and math and, and specific reasons, mm-hmm. um, which that's not the case for some people. Some people, their charts are completely different between health systems. Yeah. Mine yeah. happens to not be so. Because <laughs> in mine, and I think we've had this discussion before, my son in Placidus is in the ninth house, but in whole sign houses, it moves into the eighth, which just doesn't resonate for me. Like it, I'm sure it, maybe it needs another, I don't know. I'm just maybe so attuned to it being in the ninth house, right? That just feels like me, but you have a really good take on, on what that means. Don't you? Do you want to share that with everyone? Yeah. So there's lots of theories about, you know, which house systems we should use. Um, and I really believe that all house systems are totally valid and, you know, they all have different pieces of information and wisdom for us. Um, and one idea is that, we come into this life expressing a particular version of our charts. Um, One idea being that, and I wish I could remember where I learned this or or came up with this, or I don't remember, I've I've been referring to it for a long time, is that the lower numbered house, when a planet changes sign, so in this case, your eighth house, is what you're coming into the life expressing. And we're rising, we're learning how to be the higher numbered house. And so it's almost like they're, they're different phases, you know, they're different facets of who we are at different points in our lives, which, you know, I always say like the caveat, the, the disclaimer being that I, I can't experience it for myself because none of mine change houses, but I like the theory. I like the theory. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. It sounds really cool. And for those listening, there are many different housing systems and different ways of doing astrology and none of them are the one true way. They all have the right stuff in it so it's it doesn't matter which type of astrology you go and see you're going to get a really cool reading regardless so I think they all hold their own truth and they just somehow magically all work there has got to be magic afoot when it comes to astrology (laughs) it's so true it's so true well and I one thing I always love is when a client or a family member or something comes to me and they want me to look at their chart but they're not sure of their birth time right they know it's you know I oh I know it's in the evening or you know they can't quite get exact very often what I find is if I'll pull their chart for a couple different times, you know, oh, it's somewhere in here, right? We can kind of narrow down their rising sign. Very often between the, you know, if we can get it down to like maybe two, there will be really similar themes based on the house placements, regardless of the rising sign. And obviously they're going to be really different charts in a way, but they have some connection. There's still some like themes that regardless are, are underlying, you know, and I just love that, that even when we can't quite know everything, we can't quite get it right down to the minute. um, There's there's still so much wisdom there for us. I just, I love astrology. It's my, it's my language. (laughs) I totally agree. Do you, do you offer rectification as a service or it's just sort of something you do with some people? Yeah. You know, it's not a service I offer at all, but definitely with family members and friends and things, especially who, you know, may not have their birth certificate or, or know exactly what time they were born. Um, you know, trying to help them get their chart put together. Um, and a handful of times I've done it with clients, you know, okay, we know it was between these, these hours, but we don't know exactly when. Um, and yeah, it, it's interesting. It's, I don't, I don't know that I believe we can ever really know for sure. Um, but you know, if we can, if we can get whatever wisdom out of it that we are able to, I think that's valuable. Um, but yeah, I know there's people who do that, like are really, really skilled at, at rectification, which I think is very magical. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, it's not something you see often. There's not many rectification astrologers, I think, because to get that detail, it actually takes quite a lot of time. But I'm, I'm the same as you for friends and family, my mom, especially she was adopted. Uh, funny story, maybe for another time, but she found out in her thirties, get this just around her son return, just like early, early thirties that she was adopted by her grandmother. So who she thought was her sister was actually her mother. 
who she thought was her mum and dad were actually her grandparents. So all her brothers and sisters were her aunts and uncles. All her nieces and nephews were her brothers and sisters. Super trippy. Uh, my husband often says whenever I talk about the family tree, he's like, Hannah, please get the whiteboard out. I need I need arrows and flow charts. I'm, I'm so lost. <laughs> That is amazing. Oh my gosh. My grandmother was adopted as well. Um, and we only through recent DNA and genealogy things, we only recently in the last couple of years found out who her father actually was. Um, and yeah, it's it definitely uh, whenever there's adoption or, or any kind of family situation like that, like it adds a layer, I think, to your, your astrological chart because it definitely can impact how much you know about when you were born. And I think to our magic too, that that access to ancestry is, is very powerful and to, to have something either kind of blocking that, that makes it a mystery um, or, you know, that's, that there's some, some shadowy things around, I think can be, be very interesting and, and really have an impact on, you know, the way we access who we are and our intuition. And I think that becomes generational too. You know, I mean, I, I was not adopted, but my grandmother was, and it definitely still impacts me. It's not quite as, it's a crazy story, but it's not quite that crazy of a story. <laughs> oh, it's a crazy story. And like, whilst we still know the genealogy, like I know it's still in the family, right? It's not from an outside family, um, but we don't know who her father was and her sister has never, ever said it, her sister mother. Um, I have like cousin aunties and like it, it's weird. We sound really backwards. <laughs> So, um, but it was, I mean, it was back in the sixties. So her mother was a teen, she was a, a, a teen, teenager. She was 16 and pregnant. They shipped her off to the convent to give birth. Hence why we don't have a birth time. And she's not someone that we can get that time out of. Um, and yeah, the, the mother, the grandmother pretended to be pregnant with a you know pillow under her tummy when she went to church. Like it's wild to think that that's sort of what happened, but it did. And it's very interesting. We did get some answers around the father, but um, I mean, it's yeah, very like family secrets and all of that. It's quite interesting to go right. through. But anyway, it was good with my mum because the moon actually changed signs quite late in the day, right? And when I looked at both moon signs, it just me knowing her, I was like, you are definitely, definitely not a Cancer moon. You are a Leo moon. Like that is that's so absolutely you. So we kind of we're able to narrow it down to just a few hours, which makes it really yeah. easy. That doesn't happen with everyone. Sometimes the moon's in the same sign for two days. So it, it makes it a little bit harder in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure of my grandmother's birth time. Um, and I, I definitely, I, it's one of those where I'm like, I could see either because she has a stellium, major stellium, like all planets in Gemini. And then the moon was either in Taurus or Gemini. So it's like, well, we know she's Gemini, but she could have a little bit of Taurus too. I can see that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's where it makes it a bit hard. I do find as well when you're doing family members, there's usually a common link, a major placement that everybody shares. Uh, as I've done my family, my my husband, both my children, my brother and my dad all have a Virgo moon. Oh. Wild. And I'm a Virgo son. I'm like, this is this is wild. Like it just, it's really interesting when you start to see all of those patterns and how they come through. So yes, definitely. So talking about patterns, what I actually wanted to chat with you about today was cycles, specifically the wheel of the year and things like the moon phases, which are topics that you cover in your latest book, The Modern Witch's Guide to Natural Magic. So I wanted to know, when did you become aware of the moon phases or the wheel of the year? Which one came first for you? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, on like a, not really an intellectual level, but just a experience level, um, I was always really, really aware of both as a kid. Um, and I think that really comes from my mom. Um, that she was, in fact, she joked recently that it's her fault I'm a witch because <laughs> she exposed me to all these things when I was a kid, you know, they were just important to her. Um, and so I always remember like the full moon rising out. I could see it from my bedroom window when I was a kid. Um, and I, I even talk about it in the book that like celebrating the seasons was really important in my family. You know, we, every year, even now, I, I still do this on, on September 1st, like we pull out all of the fall decorations and we would do that. My mom and I, when I was a kid, 
And, you know, Christmas was a big deal in my house. And, you know, like right after Christmas, my mom would always completely clean the house for the new year and put up white lights. And just like each of the seasons was important, you know. Um, And it wasn't really necessarily grounded in something spiritual, but I wouldn't say that it wasn't either. You know, it was just, it was this important rhythm that that we followed Um, and and into the spring and everything. And, And in many ways, I think birthdays kind of factored into that. We have a lot of spring birthdays in our family. Um, and so there was just this like kind of rhythm of celebration, even as a little kid. Um, and, and that I think goes back generations because I, I've recently been, um, going through photo albums at my grandparents' house and trying to scan some of the pictures. Um, and it's the same, you know, I mean, and I know everyone's photo albums are all, you know, Christmas and things like that, but I joke that like all of our photo albums, there's always Halloween is always in there. <laughs> Like all of the pictures of the women of my family were either in costumes or holding some kind of animal. Like, like we're just, it's just, it's just there, you know, it's just always been kind of part of my life. Um, and then when I started practicing and I, I started coming to it as a spiritual practice, uh, I'm honestly, I'm not sure which really came first. My instinct is maybe the moon phases that the full moon was always something I felt really, really drawn to. Um, And then when I started kind of learning a little bit more about, you know, paganism and Wicca and these different paths, I mean, I I came to learn about the Wheel of the Year. um, And the first festival that I celebrated in my own practice um, happened to be Lamas or Lunasa, um, not for any particular reason. It was just the next one that was coming up. Um, But it's always had kind of a special place for me because of that. Yeah, I mean, that one has a special place for me just because I like bread, so... (laughs) hundred <laughs> percent. And how do you, how have you found tuning into these cycles has helped you in your life? Yeah. I mean, I think number one, I think it can really help have a more consistent practice, um, which is something I know we all struggle with. It's like the number one thing my clients tell me that they're, they're having challenges with. Um, it's just hard to prioritize our spirituality and especially when we have an alternative spiritual path, right? Um, and so, you know, following these cycles can be really, really helpful and has been really helpful for me with consistency because there's always there's always a next marker, you know, with the moon phases, they can give us a, a weekly or a bi-monthly marker, um, depending on which phases you're working with. Uh, you know, the season, the wheel of the year, I particularly love because it gives us those six-week markers um, in the equinoxes and solstices alone are really powerful, but I like the cross quarter days because I think we can kind of lose the thread, you know, between the three months of an entire season. Um, so I find that the, the fire festivals and the cross quarter days can kind of bring us back to, you know, bring us back to what the season is there for. And, you know, it's just very grounding and can help us really be mindful and present and kind of know where we are. You know, I think it's so easy to, to lose that thread through the year and to, you know, be like, and I mean, I've said it myself a dozen times in the last two weeks, like, how is it, you know, August? How is that possible? <laughs> how is that possible? I don't know. But even feeling that way, like, where did the year go? I still know that, like, I, I've, I've checked in at those points, you know, and I've, I've made, I've noticed those markers and those shifts. Um, so that's a, a really big thing for me is just kind of giving you those checkpoints through the year. Um, and I also think that it's really, and especially tying astrology into it has really helped me to be more mindful of my own energy. I, I've always had very inconsistent energy. Um, I've always been, you know, very, lots of, lots of momentum and very productive, but also days when I just like cannot get out of my own way. And it's always been that way. Um, and for a long time, I really struggled with that. And when I started working with these cycles and with my own astrological chart, um, I realized that it wasn't really nearly as random as I had always thought it was. You know, there there are certain days of the month when the moon is in particular signs, certain months of the year when the sun is in particular signs, when I just have less energy. And that has given me so much permission and grace to just be in flow with that, you know, which um, that I think is one of the biggest takeaways is we have cycles too. Absolutely. And I love what you say about the wheel of the year being like a checkpoint. I almost find those 
especially the solstice and the equinoxes. They're almost like my my most important days. Um, I love the solstice in particular, but just love them. But I find them really anchoring, like they anchor me into that time of the year, that season, those traditions, those rituals that we all uphold. So sometimes the other ones I might be, you know, things might happen, you get sick, you might have you know, busy weeks or whatever's happening in life, family dramas, all of that. And the other ones they can sort of, I can push them away, but it, the solstices and the equinoxes, but mainly those solstices, they just anchor me in my practice. I'm like, at least if I get this, if I do this, I feel grounded. I feel with, you know, within my practice and connected to the earth and the earth's movements and what's happening. And they're really clear as well in terms of how you see them, because where I live currently, I'm in Northern Australia and there isn't much difference in the seasons. Like we're in winter at the moment, whilst it's a bit cooler, everything looks exactly the same as summer. So you don't see, we don't have fall like you guys, we don't have any leaves falling off the trees. I mean, the, the grass grows a little slower, but there's not too much of an external factor coming in. But when it comes to the shortest day of the year and the longest day of the year, you can see that. It is hard to ignore that. It's really, really visible. And, you know, it just sort of brings that practice back home, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I like to think of each of the, the eight festivals as a season, you know, the, the solstices and the equinoxes is a little bit different for me since it is so connected to that specific light on those particular days, you know, but, but in general, I like to think of them as seasons because you're right. Like we get busy or things happen and you can't necessarily celebrate, right? We don't have these days off of work typically. Right. Um, so it can be hard. It, it's not as easy to factor it into your calendar as this big celebration sometimes as you know, a more mainstream holiday. Um, and so I really like to think of them as seasons that, you know, I, and I, I like to do that astrologically. So like with Lamas that we've just celebrated in the Roman hemisphere, um, you know, it's really Leo season is Lamas season. Um, Lamas always happens during Leo season. And in the Southern hemisphere, it's during Aquarius season. Um, and that's predictable. That's always the case. And I like to kind of celebrate it the, the whole time of the season. You know, I always make cornbread and um, this honey butter that I make for Lamas every year. And this year I even said it like it was Lamas and I was like, oh, I'm going to make it. And then that day just got away from me. It didn't happen. It was Monday. It didn't happen. Um, and I made it like the following weekend. So it was a good week later, you know, but I didn't have to feel weird about that. You know, it's like, it's a whole season. We can celebrate them throughout. Like, yes, I think there is a certain amount of magic to the given day, but especially with the solstices and equinoxes. But I think it's also more about just noticing the shifts, however tiny they are, right? Whether it's shifts in light or shifts in what's growing or shifts in the weather, like just really being aware of those. Sometimes that's my practice, you know, just noticing what the tree outside my bedroom window looks like, you know? Yeah, I love that. And I like the idea of it being a season and not so caught up on those those days particularly so this year this is our first year living in this area and I'm really used to around in bulk seeing these beautiful blossoms that we used to have when we lived in the south and there was just no blossoms I usually decorate my altar with them and I was on my Instagram stories I was like guys there's no blossoms here what do I do like there's nothing for me to bring inside and to reflect the season and then I was on a walk and I did notice that one of the wattle trees were in bloom it's this beautiful yellow flower really like terrible if you get any form of allergies is just full of pollen but it smells delightful and I love it and so I was like I'll, I'll just get a little bunch and I'll just place it on my altar to represent the season up here obviously it's it's flowering time so I did that however thankfully one of my uh, patreon followers messaged me and they were like so by the way there is a, a local indigenous group here they've just posted something about bringing wattle into the home is bad luck and I was like oh no, I've, I've angered the traditional land spirits. And I had to like, <laughs> like oh, it. No. oh yeah, it was like, a, I didn't know. And, and a lot of that sort of thing happens. So I quickly took it outside. Apparently if you keep it hanging above your door, uh, it can prevent bad spirits from entering, entering the home, which is the Aboriginal belief. Uh, but they do say not to bring it into the house. And I was like, okay, cool. I, now I know. And next year when I see the wattle, I can know, all right, we're, we're changing seasons. 
uh, and we're going to put that on the outside of the home not the inside so yeah. well and I think that's such an important message an important lesson for all of us that number one right our, our climates are different like you know the, the wheel of the year is based in the UK, basically, it's based in the Celtic countries. And it doesn't necessarily apply exactly the same way to everybody across the board, right. And I think we have to figure out what it looks like for us. Um, and often, you know, on the West Coast in California, we don't have seasons the way that they do in the Celtic countries, we don't have seasons, we definitely don't have seasons the way they do in the East Coast. Um, but I know, I know what our seasons look like, you know, I know that there's this, these subtle shifts. Um, and I mean, even, so we, uh, one of the kind of like hallmarks of the California seasons is our, our golden hills, which is, people say they're golden, they're just brown, but you know, we, we romanticize it a little bit. Um, but you know, the in the summertime, we have very little rain. And so everything kind of turns brown and it is pretty in a way, but it's very different. Um, and it's funny because it might stay green, pretty green into June, maybe even July. And, and the, the pasture behind my house is partially irrigated. It's for horses and things. So, so it stays green most of the year. But I noticed just in the last like week or two that the pasture behind my house all of a sudden is more brown than it was. And it was just this very subtle shift that I would only notice because I look out that window every single morning. And when I woke up, even this morning, I was like, oh gosh, it really shifted. Like it's really, it's really turning. And it'll turn more brown before winter starts and it starts to turn green again when we actually have rain again. Um, and it's so funny. It, like it's so different than seasons in a lot of other places. And just having that awareness makes the wheel of the year relevant wherever you are. You know, I think that that's a complaint we often hear about the wheel of the year is like, well, it's not relevant in a, a huge swath of the world, right? And I think that it really is. We just have to tweak it for where we are, for what our climate's like, for the, the traditions of our land that we live on. Um, while also, if, if we do come, like our ancestors did come from those countries that it's founded around, also honoring that too. I think there can also be an ancestral component if that's relevant to us. Yeah, absolutely. So I also wanted to talk about in terms of the moon phases, how do you think people can start to tune into that, to those in a way that's not overwhelming? Because I know it's something that a lot of new witches to the craft are like, sweet, I want to start working with the moon. And then they're like, oh my gosh, what is it doing? I'm so overwhelmed. So what do you think is the best advice that you would give to someone new to the craft around their moon practice? Yeah, I know so many of us come to come to everything because of the moon. Um, it's such a gateway. So one thing that I think is really important is when you look up, you know, you Google moon phases, it'll usually tell you that there's like eight or nine moon phases. And that is true. And they all have their own kind of unique nuance and power. But I think it's much too complicated and much too overwhelming. Um, I I do work the caveat and I do work with the, the more subtle phases a tiny bit. Um, but for the vast majority of my practice, and definitely the way I recommend, is to just work with the four main phases, which are the new moon, the waxing moon, the full, and the waning moon. Um, and the new and full moons both last about three days. The waxing and waning moons both last almost two weeks. Um, and so with the peak of those being the quarter moons, um, which the new waxing quarter, full, and waning quarter moons are for each about a week apart. And so one thing, kind of like the, the most I would recommend anyone, anyone get started with is to make that a weekly devotional practice. Right, honoring each of those four key phases one day each week um, in whatever way you like, you know, whether that's doing some journaling or uh, taking a bath or just lighting candles or pulling cards or something like that. Um, personally, I really just work with the new and full moons myself, um, with the exception of I do like to work with the moon signs. So every month the moon moves through all 12 signs of the zodiac. Um, and that I definitely do work with, especially because I do find it has such an impact on my energy, like I mentioned. So, you know, kind of knowing that and paying attention to that um, every morning in my journal, I write down what is the current moon phase and what sign is it in. Um, and I kind of know, you know, after many years of doing that, what that will mean for me personally. Um, and that is the one place where I do write down, you know, the, 
it's the waning gibbous or the, the waxing crescent or, you know, some of those more nuanced phases. Um, but in general, I really only do rituals and really bark the new and full moons. And, you know, I think that whether it's, whether it's weekly or bi-weekly or, you know, daily with the moon signs, um, so much of it also, just like with the seasons, it's just about awareness, you know, and really noticing what's happening, you know, having a general understanding of what is the energy of this thing collectively, you know, the new moon is about new beginnings and fresh starts. The full moon is very intuitive. It's about gratitude and reflection. Um, but also what do those things really mean to you? And just really starting to track that and pay attention to it. Like that's the most important thing I think you can really do. With it. Yeah, I agree. And yeah, keeping it simple, you don't need all of the moon phases to form a part of your practice unless you want to, but definitely not straight away. Do you, do you ever work with the dark moon phase yourself? I do. I was actually born on a dark moon. So it is a, it is one that's kind of close to my heart. Um, and that's kind of the, the ninth, the mysterious ninth phase that you'll sometimes see, um, which for anyone who doesn't know, the dark moon is the last, the last day or two before the new moon. Um, and I do love the dark moon. I really, you know, it's just kind of like an amplified version of the waning moon, which is about releasing. Um, but for someone who wants to bring in something a little bit different, or a little bit more nuanced for themselves, um, I, do, I think the dark moon is a really particularly magical and, you know, kind of shadowy, witchy time. Um, great for shadow work, great for, you know, any of that, just like releasing and kind of shedding anything that's not, not serving us. So we don't need to continue holding on to into the next cycle. Yeah. I like to do some really uh, deep divination on a dark moon. So particularly using my black scrying mirror. So that would be, I pretty much reserve that for dark moons only I don't use that willy-nilly it's not like my tarot cards which just pop out every day that is like a sacred special thing that I follow the moon phases with and especially with a dark moon a, a black mirror you don't want a lot of light so doing it on a full moon wouldn't really work to its purpose as well and ah, uh, I love that yeah, I know it's really fun it feels really witchy and spooky as well which is great <laughs> Uh, the other thing as well with the with the dark moon phase, I think it can be really useful for cord cutting rituals um, or binding rituals, any form of divination, all of that sort of thing is what I sort of reserve for that time. Now, since you were born on a dark moon phase, I'm very curious. Do you find you are more creative when you are left alone with your thoughts? Would you say that's when yeah. I, the moon phase we're born under is kind of where our creativity comes up right yeah yeah I definitely think that it reflects a certain like very private kind of intuitive energy um and I, I love to work with them in phase that we're born under I think that can be really powerful for number one understanding the way that we relate to the moon cycle some people find like oh I'm so tired during the full moon like what do you mean that's supposed to be this you know energizing time like well it depends on how you interact with it yourself right it's not just what we say in books um I say as an author who writes about the moon um trust your intuition first not me um but yeah I definitely find that the dark moon tends to be tends to be a time where I, I don't know if I feel energized exactly like it's not necessarily always the most productive time sometimes not always um but I do find that it it it's I mean like anything when it comes into your chart right when the moon is in your moon sign when the sun is in your sun sign like you just feel so much in alignment. Um, you just feel at home in yourself, you know? Um, and yeah, I would definitely say that for me with the dark moon energy, it, it's very intuitive. It's very, um, like you said, um, kind of on your own space to think your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I find I was born on a waxing crescent. And for myself, I find I'm really creative, particularly when I'm in like that research and planning phase of any project that I'm doing. And I find that's how that energy comes through me. I just, I find, I don't know, just the phase that we are born under really relates in with our creativity and when it sort of shines the most, which is really intriguing. With uh, those who already track the cycles of the moon, what's something they could do to potentially level up in their connection? 
well, so one thing that I definitely recommend people start doing is tracking the moon signs and how that interacts with your chart. So understanding not only what sign is the moon in, which, you know, people will often say like, oh, you know, when the moon is in Pisces, like people might feel more emotional or when it's in Aries, people might feel, you know, more passionate, right? And, and those things are generally true, right? Like that's the collective energy. But what I think is much more important is what is it activating in your own chart? Um, and this is something I do with a lot of my clients. I think it's probably like our most watched workshop in my, my member portal, but everybody goes to that one because it really is so powerful is a whole workshop around being able to do this. Like what is it actually activating in your chart? What planets is it activating? What house is it activating? And so for me, for example, like my lowest energy days of the month and time of the year, because this also applies to the sun, um, is when the moon or the sun are in Leo. Um, and that's because it's my 12th house, which is you know, the last house in the Zodiac before we kind of start fresh um, in our with our rising sign. Um, and my Chiron is also there. So it's also you know, like kind of a very sensitive, shadowy kind of a space for me. And I know that. And it's something that I had such a hard time with for years that around this time of year, every year, I would just feel so out of sorts and I would feel so tired and I just wouldn't feel like myself and I would take it out on the people around me. <laughs> and at some point, several years ago, I learned about this and I realized that it was Leo season every year that I was struggling so much with. And now I find that knowing that and knowing like the, when the moon is going to be in Leo as well, it changes it so much because you still might feel lower energy, but I know that it's going to happen. Right. And I can prepare for it and I can either, you know, rearrange my schedule, rearrange things to, to support me in that. Or if that's not possible, sometimes it's not. At least I'm going into that knowing how I'm likely to be feeling. And it just gives you so much more knowledge about yourself. Um, and so kind of as a rule of thumb, I find that when the moon is in the water houses of your chart, so when the moon activates your fourth, eighth and twelfth houses, those tend to be the days when you want the, the most rest, when you might feel more tired, you might also feel more intuitive, but it's this more kind of yin flowing kind of energy, right? You're not likely to be out there producing in quite the same way. Now, granted, the exceptions are when you have planets, like my eighth house is packed. So when the moon is in my eighth house, I'm happy. Like that, that's, a, that's an easy space for me. Um, so it depends so much on what's going on in your own chart. So that I think is definitely a huge way that you can really up-level your practice with the moon is not only understanding the phase and the sign, but really what that means for you based on your own chart. That's so funny when you're talking about the 12th house. My 12th house happens over Christmas time, which every year, like it's so busy. We're going to see so many people. All I want to do is be by myself. All I want to do is like just crawl into a hole and I'm like, no, everyone leave me alone, but you're kind of forced to socialize and it's always really difficult. Like I'm fighting against my inner energy. So definitely a great place for people to look in their chart. And if you're not sure as well, if you're, you're not really sure where things are, um, I do have a service that I have released called my yearly guidance report. And it talks about the sun's transit through each of the houses. And it's a full page on each house and your exact dates in your birth chart. So it says, you know, this is what you're likely to be feeling. This is uh, what you should be focusing on this month. And here are some really great ways to utilize this energy. It gives you some like little advantage points at the bottom. And that doesn't change every, like it's not a get it every year. That's the same. Like the dates might change slightly but not enough for it to matter so that is yours for life so that's a little promo that's sort of relevant to what we're talking about yes, I love that everyone should totally get that because it is so helpful to have that information and you know I learned all of this kind of by trial and error as I was learning astrology and kind of putting all these pieces together for myself but you know if, if you're not into doing the legwork which i do not recommend <laughs> get someone who's who's very wise and can do it for you and can look at your chart because understanding this about yourself because we have this monthly cycle of the moon moving through all 12 signs all of your chart and then the yearly cycle of the sun doing the same thing and when you can start to understand those cycles within yourself i really think it's such a game changer it gives us so much more power 
to not feel like we're blindsided by our emotions or our, our energy level. You know, we're, we're not kind of at their mercy. We know what's happening. We know that it's a reflection of as above, right? Really, we can really be intentional and mindful about that. Definitely. And I think as well, it gives us permission, like permission to rest is one thing that personally I definitely need. So when I see something, I'm like, oh, that's going to be calling me into rest or to slow down. All right. And then I know that and I don't feel so guilty when I have those low energy days. So it definitely helps in that regard. Absolutely. I think that is one of my favorite things about astrology, both understanding you know, the transits and everything that might be activating us at any given time and also our own birth chart is it gives us so much permission to be who we are, to express our energy in the way that we do, you know, and and we're going to probably express our energy that way regardless. It's just a matter of whether we're going to fight it, like you said, or we're going to be in flow with it. And I also think that in those circumstances, like you were talking about around the holidays, maybe we can't rest, right? Maybe we can't make that change for whatever reason. Sometimes that's true, but I, I still think having the awareness of like, okay, this is why I feel this way. And I'm going to, you know, excuse myself from that one gathering that I know I can. I'm going to, you know, step away from this thing. I'm going to, you know, maybe put my, my social media on hiatus, whatever, you know, whatever it is we can do, the things that are within our control. Um, we know that it's time to take advantage of those. Definitely. And it just, gives you a little bit of an insight into why you're feeling that way so you're not like just frustrated at yourself why am I so annoyed every year I should be excited you know those sorts of things um now switching back to our wheel of the year topic as well do you have a favorite day on the wheel of the year oh this is always the question I think I can give a different answer every time <laughs> it's allowed to change you can change your mind change my mind I am I am partial to Lamas and Imbolc um Lamas because it was the first that I ever celebrated in my own practice um and Imbolc as its opposite um I just love both of them that they're they're so kind of quiet and simple and you know, they're they're really in many ways especially Imbolc but both of them are just really about self-care and rest and kind of tuning in before things get busy again you know we are heading into the the most magical, busiest time of the year. Um, And that's exciting. And I'm excited for, you know, Samhain and fall and the holidays and all the things that are coming in the next few months. Um, But it's kind of nice to have that that little brief rest first. Um, So I find that Lamas and Imbolc are are very intuitive and and kind of personal for me in a way. Um, But, you know, I I love them all. (laughs) I I can wax on about probably all of them, so... Do you have any particular rituals that you do on in bulk or uh, we've heard about your Lamas one, but anything that you do on in bulk to make the day special? Yeah, you know, I mean, nothing huge. It's a funny season where I am because in, in some way, I mean, it, so it doesn't snow where I am. So we don't have that, um, that element of it. And it, a lot of the flowers that you associate with in bulk start blooming here in December. <laughs> So our seasons are a little off, right? Um, so it, it does feel like in bulk, it's still cold, certainly. Um, well, cold by cold by California standards. Um, but it, it's it's not quite, it feels more springy in a lot of ways. Um, and so some of the kind of classic traditional in bulk things around, you know, snow and ice, like they just don't make sense. Um, and so my favorite kind of association of in bulk is the connection to milk. Um, ironically, given that I don't drink milk, I do eat cheese, but um, probably shouldn't. Um, but what I love to do is a milk bath. Um, so I'll usually not necessarily do a full bath, but at least like a foot or hand soap um, with like warm milk and lavender and lavender essential oils. Um, and it's just, there's something so like cozy and comforting and it really makes your skin feel amazing. Um, and it just feels like, like true self-care, you know, like there's no other purpose for it. It's just to relax and like treat yourself. Um, so I like to do things like that at Invoke and, you know, just like a cup of tea and candles and, you know, maybe pull some cards or, or maybe just like watch a movie, you know, something, something really relaxing. That sounds delightful. And for any plant-based people out there, 
coconut milk is really great in the bath as well as an alternative. So still gives the that. same vibe and smells really yummy as well. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, uh, what would you give as advice to any new witches on their path? What is like your number one like quote or a special piece of advice to help people on their way? I think that the first thing that's so important is to really start working to understand and trust your intuition. Because when you're starting out on a path like this, it's number one, it can feel so overwhelming, right? Like there's so many different ways you can be a witch and everyone has a different, a different story and a different tool for you. Um, And I think that that in some ways, like stymies a lot of people and it's like I just don't even know where to begin right um and so when you really start working with your intuition whether that's through your dreams or working with cards or or a pendulum or some other kind of divination um or just meditating like it can manifest in a lot of different ways but working with your intuition and knowing what it sounds like or feels like or and I mean I don't have to tell you this but um, <laughs> you're, you're the expert on this but you know, really knowing like what it sounds like or feels like in your body. And then also working to trust that, which I think is a key often missing step, right? But like sometimes we know, but we still doubt it. Um, and once you can do that, you can know what it, what it sounds like or feels like, or how those messages come to you and you trust it, then it doesn't feel so overwhelming because you can read something in a book and know, no, that's not for me and have no attachment to it, you know? Um, you can, you know, see someone on Instagram who you love and normally you love everything they say, but this one thing well, that doesn't resonate and that's cool, right? Like when you trust your intuition, it becomes so much easier to create a path that is really yours and that really works for you and makes sense for you, um, without, you know, being able to really shed a lot of that overwhelm. I think that's one of the beautiful things about witchcraft as well you can make it your own practice. Most other religions, you don't have that option. If you're doing something, you're doing it because you kind of have to or have been told to. And even if it doesn't vibe, you're like, no, but I have to, to be this religion. Witchcraft is totally different. It is your own. You make it whatever you want it to be. And that is the beauty. And that is where the magic happens as well. Absolutely. Yeah. When you really make it your own. And, and I think that a lot of times we come to this path because we don't want those rules. And then we find that, oh, actually, it's kind of scary and overwhelming to not have any rules. Like, oh, this is different because there aren't a lot of spaces in our lives where there aren't any rules. Um, and so I think that that intuitive piece, if you can, you know, take Hannah's course and learn how to trust your intuition, um, it really makes such a massive difference because you no longer have to wonder, like, am I doing this right? Is this the right way to do this? You know, even if you know that there's no rules, that can still bubble up. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's my my big key takeaway. (laughs) I love it. It's fantastic. So can you tell everyone who's listening a little bit about the offerings that you have and where where they can find your book, where they can find you online, that sort of a thing? Yeah, so everything's on my website. It's witchoflupinhollow.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Loop and Hollow. Um, and there's tons of free resources on my website. I have a really fun quiz. I have a free class about the moon phases where we talk about a lot of a lot of this in more depth. Um, and I have a podcast. So all of that's on the website. And then if you want to work with me, uh, the main space to work with me is my membership, the Starlight Coven, um, which is celebrating its third anniversary right now, which is Ooh. wild to me. Yay. Um, it's a really wonderful space. Um, it's uh, a learning community. We have a workshop every month. We have a huge library of resources and trainings and all sorts of things to help you learn to read your birth chart, work with the wheel of the year, track the moon in your life, all of this stuff that we've been talking about. Um, and then we have rituals with, for the wheel of the year every year, um, all on Zoom, members all over the world. It's a really, really special community. Um, then we have a private Facebook group as well. Um, where share and just it's a really special space so that's that's the main space that's right there on my website um and then you know I do I do astrology readings and a free Facebook group and all all the things all the places um but yeah everything's on the website love that and I'll pop that link in the description box below and what what is the name of your podcast so anyone listening can go and look at it now 
Yeah, the podcast is the Empowered Modern Witches Show. Um, I am not nearly as diligent and consistent as you are, um, but new episodes come out periodically. Um, some interviews, and we talk about the the wheel of the year and everything there too. Um, and then, yeah, the books as well are you know everywhere. Everywhere you buy books, your local bookstore, you can order them from or Amazon. Or if you want signed copies, you can get those on my website too. Fantastic. Thank you so, 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 so much for joining me today. Today, it's been absolutely lovely. As I've said to everyone, all links will be in the description for this episode. So make sure to check out those show notes. If you'd like to book in with me for a tarot or astrology reading, you can do so at suburbanwitchery.com. That's where you'll find all of the information for my courses and everything else as well. You'll also find me at Suburban Witchery on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And make sure you follow our podcast specific Instagram, which is at Witch Talks Podcast. I hope to see you there. As always, hope you have a lovely day wherever you are in the world today. And thank you very much for listening. Did you know you can book a chakra checkup with yours truly, Hannah, the Suburban Witch? This is a little report that can make a lot of difference in your life. This service helps to put you back in the driver's seat and steer away from feeling stuck or blocked and head straight towards alignment and ease. You can see all of our five-star reviews over on Facebook, Google, or even our testimonials page on the website. Simply head to suburbanwitchery.com to book yours now.